city council in the entire country. We like to think so. And the federal government came in and, and caused a great deal of harm, in my opinion. Welcome to Marijuana, Compassion and Common Sense. I'm Lanny Swardlow, the host of your show. And today we're in the courtyard of the UCLA Medical Center and the David Giffen School of Medicine. We're going to be interviewing Dr. Donald Tashkin, one of the premier researchers on marijuana and its effects on the human body. But before we get to that, I just want to remind you that this show is brought to you by the Marijuana Anti-Prohibition Project. And we have two meetings each month which we encourage you to attend. Our meetings are on the first Sunday of every month at 3 p.m. at the Cathedral City Public Library. And it's on the second Wednesday of every month at 7.30 p.m. in Joshua Tree at the Joshua Tree Community Center. And if you live in an area where there isn't a, a local medical marijuana patient support group and law reform organization, and you need to organize one, give me a call at 799-2055 and I'll be glad to talk with you about how to form your own organization. That's 760-799-2055. Dr. Donald Tashkin has been in the news a lot lately because of his studies on how marijuana affects human body in relation to cancer and how it affects the body in relation to how it affects the lungs. And I think you're going to find this interview to be very interesting, very enlightening, and you're going to learn a lot. Here at the UCLA Medical Research Center, we're in front of the offices of Dr. Donald Tashkin. We're now going to interview Dr. Tashkin's done some amazing studies on marijuana and its effects on the human body. Let's go in and have a little talk with him. We're now in the offices of Dr. Donald Tashkin, noted pulmonary researcher here at the UCLA School of Medicine. Thank you very much for joining us today, Doctor. It's my pleasure. Um, the show, of course, is Marijuana, Compassion, and Common Sense, and we'd like to talk to you about, you've done years of research uh, with, with marijuana in relation to pulmonary systems, is that correct? That's right. Would you like me to tell you? Yeah, the, tell us a little bit my, about your, 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 your... About my research and the results. I'm primarily interested in the health effects of marijuana, with the focus on potential adverse or harmful effects of marijuana rather than beneficial effects. Uh, therefore, what I have to say uh, may uh, have some negativity to it in terms of the potential medicinal applications of marijuana use. But uh, marijuana is smoked, generally. I mean, it could be eaten, but it's usually smoked. And uh, it has very many of the same components in the smoke as are, as are found in tobacco. Well, that, that was one of your research studies, wasn't it, to determine the uh, carcinogens in, tobacco, in some marijuana smoke? Well, our focus was actually to look not just at cost, potential carcinogenic effects of marijuana, but also uh, other uh, possible uh, health consequences, including uh, chronic bronchitis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, impairment in the lungs, uh, defense against infection, such as uh, pneumonia. Uh, so we did wide-ranging studies over the past more than 30 years. Uh, now I could actually tell you in a nutshell what the results of those studies well, are if you were Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I want to get to that. First, okay. why did you get involved in marijuana research? What, what interest you in, in, in marijuana research in particular? Well, I, uh, honestly, uh, I was asked asked to look at the short-term acute effects of marijuana on the lung by another investigator who had a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health back in the 1970s. And he felt, uh, rightly, that since uh, marijuana smoke is similar to tobacco smoke in many respects, and we know that marijuana smoke, that tobacco smoke is harmful to the lung, that perhaps marijuana might share some of the same uh, unhealthful consequences. So he asked me to look at short-term effects of marijuana <coughs> smoking on the lung. We know that when you smoke tobacco, the airways, the bronchi tubes, tend to constrict immediately after uh, smoking, and that constriction narrowing rem remains for uh, several minutes, more than 15, 30 minutes. 
So my first uh, experiment was to see what happens to the size, the caliber of the airways after smoking marijuana compared to smoking tobacco. And I was amazed that after smoking marijuana, the airways actually opened up, dilated, in contrast to the effect of tobacco. So this piqued my interest. And we subsequently applied for some funding to look more carefully and in greater detail uh, at the effects of marijuana on lung function, both the short-term effects and the long-term effects. That got me interested, and the more and more that we researched marijuana effects on the, on the lung, we found important differences from tobacco that kept us going. Well, now what studies have you participated in that you feel kind of stand out as, as uh, on your marijuana research? Because I know you must have done a whole bunch. Right. Uh, we, uh, back in the 1980s, we recruited a large cohort of uh, people uh, from the Los Angeles area who smoked marijuana uh, heavily. By heavily, we mean at least one joint a day. Uh, for at least five years. And on the average, they smoked about three joints a day for 15 years. So it's pretty heavy smoking. Uh, we also recruited people who didn't smoke marijuana but smoked tobacco only. Uh, smokers of both marijuana and tobacco, in fact, there were more of those than the marijuana only smokers, as you might <laughs> surmise, uh, and also uh, non smokers of anything as controls. And there were about over 450 such individuals, and we have tracked them until the present time. So we performed a battery of studies on them initially, and we repeated some of those studies over time. And those studies consisted of just administering a health questionnaire to find out whether or not there was any impact of marijuana smoking on respiratory health. And we found that there was that there was a, a much higher proportion of marijuana smokers marijuana only without tobacco, who complained of cough on most days for at least three months out of the year for two or more years. That's the definition of chronic bronchitis. They also brought up sputum. They wheezed on more than 21 uh, days a year. They didn't have any increased shortness of breath uh, compared to, uh, to control. So immediately we could say from this study uh, that marijuana smoking, heavy regular marijuana smoking is associated with chronic bronchitis. Now, uh, and, and about a comparable proportion of tobacco smokers also had symptoms of chronic bronchitis. So there, and we were surprised at that because the average number of tobacco cigarettes smoked per day by the tobacco smokers was about a little over a pack, 22 a day, as compared to three marijuana joints a day. So there already was a seven to one ratio and yet there was comparability with respect to the impact on respiratory symptoms. We wondered about that, and that was the basis for some other work that we did. We thought that maybe the reason for the similarity in symptoms, despite the disparity in the amount of the plant substance smoke, might be due uh, to a different way that the marijuana is smoked, might be more to, due to more delivery of uh, the irritants and the gases and particulates in the smoke from marijuana than tobacco uh, because of differences in the way the cigarette is prepared. We know that marijuana cigarette joints are loosely packed or not filtered, whereas tobacco smoke uh, cigarettes are filtered and more tightly packed. So, and what we found uh, after a series of experiments was about four times as much tar. These tar is, in, is the insoluble particulate particle fraction of the smoke which contains uh, carcinogens, uh, mainly benzpyrene is the most potent of these carcinogens. Uh, and the four times as much was deposited in, in, the, in, the, in, in the lung uh, compared from marijuana, single marijuana cigarette, compared to a tobacco cigarette of the same weight. Now, normally, marijuana cigarettes don't weigh as much as tobacco cigarettes. Uh, so that amplified the effect of tobacco, but that didn't appear to account entirely for, for this disparity. So I think that um, the, the question is not entirely answered, but maybe partially answered. We also looked at lung function. We know that if you smoke cigarettes, about, about, uh, you have about a 20% chance of developing uh, COPD, chronic, chronic obstructive bronchitis and emphysema, 
which uh, when it is severe is associated with symptoms of difficulty breathing on exertion and results in an increased mortality, not only from COPD itself, but also from heart disease. So, so we performed the test of lung function. We were surprised. We found that there was no ab abnormality that we could detect in the lung function of smokers, heavy smokers of marijuana, but there were abnormalities in lung function in the smokers of tobacco only, and there was no additive effect. So we thought, well, maybe uh, there would be a change over time, that we know that COPD is characterized by an accelerated rate of loss of lung function over time. Uh, it's a progressive disease. Well, maybe we'll see that if we repeat the lung function tests year after year. We did that in the marijuana smokers and the tobacco smokers and the controls. And lo and behold, we found that whereas lung function continued to decline at an accelerated rate in the tobacco smokers, it did not in the marijuana smokers. And that led us to believe that for one reason or another, uh, marijuana smoking, even heavy smoking, is, does not appear to be associated with the development of COPD or may not be a risk factor for COPD. Now, there are some other data in the literature that contradict that view, but uh, that, th that those were our findings. Um, that, that interested us. I have some theories as to why that is the case, but we might get to that later on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would love to get to that. But, I, but So the, the other study, of course, the reason I hear is because of the recent study on the connection between marijuana, tobacco, and lung cancer. And I was wondering, how did you come to do that study? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, well, uh, we know that uh, tobacco smoking is the most important cause of uh, lung cancer and also head and neck cancer. Marijuana smoke contains much the same uh, ingredients as, as are found in tobacco smoke, including a number of carcinogens, vinyl chlorides, um, um, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons like benzpyrene, uh, phenols, nitrosamines, uh, it contains billions of oxy radicals that cause oxidative stress that predisposes to carcinogenesis. So it's a, not an unreasonable hypothesis that if you smoke enough marijuana, uh, that you may be at increased risk for developing respiratory cancer. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I already mentioned that the exposure of the lung to the carcinogens, the tar, which are contained largely in the tar fraction, is, an, is magnified by the fact that about four times as much of the tar is deposited in the lung from a marijuana cigarette compared to a, 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 a tobacco cigarette of the same, the same mass. Uh, that's number two. Number three, there are studies in um, uh, cell cultures, uh, 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 tissue explants that show that exposure to marijuana, or lung tissue explants, that in, in, in the test tube, if you will, uh, results in mal accelerated malignant uh, change. Mm -hmm. uh, there, we know that uh, marijuana smoke is mutagenic, and, and that mutations lead to uh, uh, cancer. Uh, development. Uh, then there are um, s uh, studies that we carried out extensively uh, in uh, marijuana smokers and controlled non-smokers as well as in tobacco smokers in which we inserted a lighted scope called a bronchoscope into the airways of our subjects and we obtained biopsies of the tissue in uh, lining the airways and we were surprised to find widespread uh, changes, abnormalities, microscopic abnormalities in, in, in the cells uh, that lining the airway, some of which are known to be precancerous. And the, the extent of abnormality was similar in the tobacco and the marijuana smokers compared to the tobacco smokers, despite the disparity in the amount smoked. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I won't bore you with the names, or squamous metaplasia. We also looked at um, um, and abnormalities in, in the nuclei. Uh, uh, we also looked at molecular markers of, uh, that would predict development of, of tumors and even more aggressive tumors. Uh, KI67, it's a, a nuclear proliferation factor and epidermal growth factor receptor are two of those that we looked at. They were markedly overexpressed 
in the airways of marijuana smokers compared to non-smokers, even more than in the tobacco smokers. So that led us to believe that it's plausible to uh, expect, to hypothesize, that there might be a link between marijuana smoking and cancer. Also, there are studies in man. Uh, there are case series of uh, young people with either head and neck cancer or lung cancer uh, uh, in whom marijuana smoking is over-resented. In some of these series, uh, up to 90% of the, these individuals is rare to develop cancer when you're young, but over 90% in some series were marijuana smokers, a much higher proportion than in the general population. Also, there are some epidemiologic studies, even one of ours, that showed an increased risk. These are case control studies of, uh, uh, for head and neck cancer. On the other hand, there are other epidemiologic studies that uh, show, show the opposite or fail to show an association. Finally, we developed an animal model of lung cancer. It's a mouse model. And we found that if we implant lung cancer cells into the uh, flanks of these animals, uh, and then we treat some with THC, the major ingredient, psychoactive ingredient marijuana, and some with, with a, a vehicle placebo, if you will, uh, those who were treated with THC developed much more aggressive tumors that grew at an accelerated rate. So all this evidence led us to believe that there would be an association. But the bottom line is, you know, a mouse is not a man, and uh, is that you can't say that there's an association unless you demonstrate it in people who smoke the way they normally smoke. And that's the, why we care, that's the reason we carried out this study. And could you tell us the results? The results of the study? Yeah. The study was carried out, it was a case control study. The principal investigator was uh, Dr. Hal Morgenstern, who's a professor of public health. He used to be here. He's now a chair of epidemiology at the University of Michigan. And he's an, an expert, a world's expert in case control methodologies. It was very carefully uh, conducted. We ascertained all cases uh, diagnosed with lung cancer and head and neck cancer in Los Angeles County over a few year period rapidly ascertained these diagnoses, and then attempted to contact all of these individuals. We succeeded in a little over 50%. Some had died before we were able to contact them. Some were too sick to participate, et cetera. And then we, uh, we actually also contacted controls who were matched on age, gender, uh, and um, socioeconomic status, and the, the, air, the, the residents, the, the neighborhood. They had to be in the same neighborhood in close proximity to the case. So we actually succeeded in studying 600, about 600 lung cancer cases, about 600 head and neck cancer cases, and a thou over 1,000 uh, matched controls. We administered to every cases and controls the same extensive questionnaire that gets at their history of smoking, anything, tobacco, uh, marijuana, crack cocaine, etc., use of other drugs. Uh, other known or putative risk factors for cancer, such as a family history of cancer, diet, uh, occupational exposures, etc., etc. And uh, so from that information, using uh, uh, rather traditional statistical approaches, uh, you can determine what the risk, the relative risk is, or the odds for developing cancer, either lung cancer or head and neck cancer, in relation to, in association with marijuana, controlling for all the other factors, tobacco, alcohol, uh, socioeconomic status, age, etc. And we, the bottom line is, we failed to find any positive association between marijuana, even heavy marijuana use, which we define as uh, more than 10 joint years, even if you look at more than 60 joint years, a joint year is a joint a day times the number of joints smoked, we could not see an association. Nor, nor did we find any potentiation of the carcinogenic effect of tobacco, nor did we find any reduction in the risk from tobacco, so there was no interaction with tobacco. If anything, the risks were a little bit less than one, but not significantly so. And I don't think there really is protection, because if there were, one would see a dose-response relationship. That is, 
the heavier smokers would show more protection than the lighter smokers or lower odds ratio, if you will, and they didn't show that. So I think it's really essentially a negative study. We failed to find any positive association with cancer. Now, what does that mean? That, that, does that really mean there absolutely is no association? We don't know that. I mean, it is possible that people with the appropriate genetic makeup who are particularly susceptible to lung cancer, if they're exposed to any carcinogens, whether they be in marijuana smoke or in some other substance they're exposed to, might be a greater risk. We can't exclude that possibility, uh, but our data are unable to answer that question. Well, now, the, 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 the one, the, the, the so-called protective effect, the group that, that, that there was some, actually the people who smoked marijuana had a somewhat less development of lung cancer than the people who didn't. On, on the average, but not significant, yeah, so but, not statistically significant. Um, but yet, the people who are smoking marijuana are being exposed to these carcinogens, mm -hmm. and for some reason, they're not developing the cancers that they should be, because it, like look, tobacco smokers do, who are exposed to the same thing. So there's some, I know Dr. Abrams, I know, asked you at the conference, is, is, is there a protective effect? And you responded that was not an unreasonable hypothesis. What, what did it's you mean an, by that? It's still an hypothesis. Yeah. We know that there are, in some studies, anti-tumoral effects of THC. Not in all. In other studies show a pro-tumoral effect. Right. And these are studies that were carried out in a variety of animal models and cell cultures. And what they show is that when you expose these animals or cells to THC, there is a reduction in tumor growth, the rate of tumor growth, and also a reduction in uh, spread, metastases. And one, uh, three mechanisms have been proposed. One is an anti-proliferative effect of THC, impairment, let's say, in protein synthesis, et cetera. One is a, um, an, a so-called anti-angiogenic effect. In order for a tumor to grow and spread, it has to develop a blood supply. And it appears that THC inhibits the development of that blood supply. And, there's, and another is uh, something called a pro-apoptotic effect. That means an enhancement of early uh, programmed cell deaths. So that cells that age ought to die off early in order to prevent them from undergoing malignant change as they age. Uh, so some studies have shown a pro-apoptotic effect, other studies have shown an anti-apoptotic effect. There are other animal studies that show an anti-tumoral effect. So you could hypothesize that perhaps what's really operative in these cases is uh, an, an anti-tumoral effect that counterbalances the pro-carcinogenic effect of the carcinogens. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a possibility. That doesn't mean if you smoke you're, you're going to be less likely to develop it, it means if you smoke uh, you may be counteracting the, pro -can the cancer promoting effects of the, of the smoke. That's purely hypothetical. That's why I said it's not an unreasonable hypothesis. This, this lung cancer study was of, of great interest to us and we thought that, that well, maybe there is a potential uh, beneficial effect from in, 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 in preventing lung cancer and it certainly deserved to at least be researched. There might be a potential benefit of THC. THC, yeah. Yes, right. There's something in the marijuana, whether it's the THC or one of the other cannabinoids. There's something in it that might be a benefit. Anyway, we just thought this, you know, it should at least be studied. And so we wrote a, a, a letter. A group of us wrote individual letters to our representative Jerry Lewis, and and uh, he sent us a letter back um, that I would just like to share with you. We said we asked him, you know, we there's we sent him a copy of the article about your study and saying, you know, we think it at least deserves to be, because lung cancer is such a dangerous uh, disease and all this kind of stuff. And he wrote back that the study headed by, apparently he contacted your office. He said that the study headed by Dr. Donald Tash can certainly provide some interesting results. Not mentioned in the article included with your correspondent were comments made by Dr. Tashkin's research partner, Dr. Michael Roth. Dr. Roth contends that those who smoke marijuana have significant inflammation to their breathing passages, very much like those who smoke cigarettes, which reduce the body's ability to fight disease and infection. And should that be a reason not to? What, what, do you, what, what is your comment? That, that? that those inflammatory changes. I'm a, I'm a co-author of those papers. Right. They, they were those studies were carried out as part of our own research program, and Dr. Roth is a collaborator of mine. And we have indeed shown uh, evidence of airway injury, both visually as well as microscopically, that I alluded to before. And, but that, those effects are the effects of smoking. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if you were able to deliver THC in some other form, uh, you wouldn't see these pro-inflammatory effects. You'd probably see anti-inflammatory effects. But, so, but that supports my view as well, and I'm in agreement with Dr. Roth, that smoking would not be a reasonable route of administration for therapeutic purposes, say, for inhibiting the growth of cancer, if it turns out to be uh, truly have an anti-tumoral effect. But vaporization might be. Vaporization, I think vaporization is, a, is a, a, an interesting and, and certainly less harmful route of delivery of THC for medicinal purposes. I wouldn't deliver it to prevent cancer. <laughs> I would deliver it to relieve pain or uh, for some other purpose. Yeah. Well, Doctor, I've got a lot more questions to ask you, but today's interview we've run out, so we're going to close this one down, and we'll bring you on for our next show next week. Okay, okay real fun. Speaking with Dr. Tashkin was incredible. It was such an honor, and for him to agree to be talk with us, I mean, we're a show about marijuana, and he's one of the no most noted researchers on, on this topic. Uh, and he said some very interesting things. But he says more th interesting things that you're going to have to tune to our next program to find out. So next time when you join us, we'll have our concluding interview with Dr. Donald Tashkin. Well, this is Lanny Swardlow saying I'm glad you joined us on tonight's show and you need to get involved. How do you get involved? You can come to any of our meetings. We have two meetings each month in the Inland Empire. We meet on the first Sunday of every month at 3 p.m. at the Cathedral City Public Library at 33520 Date Palm Drive. And we also meet on the second Wednesday of every month at 7.30 p.m. at the Joshua Tree Community Center. You'll really find these meetings interesting. You'll meet medical marijuana patients. You'll find uh, you'll get a lot of good information you can pick up. You'll learn about doctors. You'll learn about medicinal supplies. You'll learn about things like this interview you're about that we just had with Dr. Tashkin. So put it on your calendar. Come to one of our meetings. And if you live in an area where you don't have a local organization, why don't you form one? I'd be glad to tell you how to do it. Give us a call about that or anything else you may have in questions about relating to marijuana and marijuana law reform at 760-799-2055. Once again, that's 760-799-2055. Or you can go to our website at www.marijuananews.org. That's not .com, that's a great website too, but ours is just a little bit greater. Well, once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. You know, invite your friends over to watch our show. Make it a marijuana, compassion, and common sense party. You'll have a great time, and you'll learn a lot. Thank you, and I look forward to you joining us on our next show. Amazing with how much people didn't know and how surprised they were when you start giving them uh, information. We met with Mary Bono, of course. I mean, I was I was impressed with ever, with everyone, unfortunately, except for Mary Bono. I couldn't believe that her representative told us he was doing us a favor listening to us. And it doesn't seem like she's listening to the constituents. My representative is not going to represent us. It's time for new representation. That's where you find. I concluded that marijuana was a necessary nutrient. Well, uh, at a time when people were dying all around me, uh, we were doing anything we could to try and save people's lives. They should reclassify the drug and take it out of Schedule 1 and put it into a schedule that can be monitored and uh, dispensed. That's where you'll